Well, welcome everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledging their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Uh, at Geoscience Australia, we pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Welcome to this morning's Wednesday seminar, which will be presented by Michael Hope. His topic is Copernicus Australasia, Australia's partnership to ensure European data for the Indo-Pacific. The, Coper the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub, or the Hub, is Australasia's gateway to Sentinel satellite data from Europe's Copernicus program in our region, covering a quarter of the Earth's surface, a free, open and trusted service that has shared over 25 petabytes of Sentinel data since going fully operational in April 2018. The Copernicus program um, is a multi-billion dollar European program spanning over 20 years, financed and managed by the European Commission. The Sentinel satellites that collect this data are built and operated by the European Space Agency and the European Organisation for the Explo Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites. A cooperation agreement between the EC and the Commonwealth, who is represented by Geoscience Australia, to access and use Sentinel data for the delivery of innovative products and services for societal benefit created the opportunity for the hub, which is enabled by technical agreements with ESA and EU METSAT. A consortium of five Commonwealth and state government agency partners fund the hub. After five years of successful operation, the partners have agreed to continue for another five years. But with the global expansion of EO data and new uses for it being discovered every day, how will the hub meet the ever-growing challenges of delivering petabytes of data to users in our region? Now a little about our speaker, Michael Hope. He's part of a small team that manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub. This includes managing the relationships that underpin the multifaceted partnership of consortium partners, suppliers and supporters who all work together to enable access and delivery of Sentinel imagery to our region. Michael obtained a Bachelor of Science with Honours in Marine Biology at James Cook University, but quickly realised a more productive career in information technology. He now has over 30 years experience in the IT industry, with almost 10 years working as a project manager with online data repositories, and I bet you've seen a lot of change over the years from a technology perspective. I get it. <laughs> Prior to starting with Geoscience Australia and the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub two years ago, um, Michael actually worked for Atlas of Living Australia based within CSIRO. So please join me in welcoming Michael to the podium. Over to you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, as Ali said, my name's Michael Hope and I've been the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub Manager uh, for a bit over two years now. Firstly, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we meet on today and also pay my respects to elders past and present. Now, in the dim distant past uh, of my career, as uh, Ali mentioned, I've been <laughs> working for a long time, um, I started work in CSIRO in Alice Springs back in 1990. Uh, and way back then, across the road from the CSIRO lab at the time was this building here. Uh, which was the Acres Alice Springs Landsat Satellite Ground Station, which has been acquiring Landsat imagery since 1979 and is still operation and managed by Geoscience Australia by some of my colleagues down here uh, today. And while, we, while I wasn't particularly involved in Earth observation at the time, one section of the CSIRO lab was dedicated to using those satellite images for rangeland management. Now, I don't mean to bore you with bits of my, uh, my history and my life story, but I bring this up to highlight that even when I wasn't inv involved with uh, Earth Observation Community, um, it w the long history and involvement Australia has had in that space um, was readily obvious. Uh, and in fact, there's been widespread use of the Landsat imagery uh, 
pretty much since it first launched, and especially uh, when the Landsat data became publicly and openly available uh, in 2008. So with this long history of our uh, uh, involvement in Earth observation data, um, it's of no surprise that independent assessments report that satellite land imaging currently brings well over $5 billion to, per annum to the Australian economy right now. Um, and they estimate that it'll bring $2 trillion uh, to our region's economies by 2030. Um, on top of that, another report has indicated that there's well over 160 government projects, uh, state and commonwealth, uh, that, are, that absolutely critically rely on getting access to this satellite data on a timely basis. So if we have a look at the value chain uh, yeah, of satellite data in Australia, Australia that has evolved with that long history. You can see, much, see that we pretty much cover it all. I've already mentioned the core satellite ground station that we have facility that we have in Alice Springs uh, that su supports the control uh, and, uh, of satellites and optimises the acquisition of the data uh, within our region. Later in this talk, I'll ex give examples of the development of processing workflows to ensure that the data uh, meets the unique needs of Australia uh, and our region, uh, as well as new science and technology, particularly in the artificial intelligence uh, machine learning space, uh, to ensure the full power of satellite data can be used and put to work and deliver that full impact in that top right-hand corner. But there are some challenges. The first one is, if we have a look at right over on that left-hand side, while we've worked with and come to reply on satellite data for a very long time, we are completely dependent on an international supply of large-scale open access data from the likes of US, Japan and Europe. And the entire right, and um, the other, the, uh, point number two, that entire right-hand side of the value chain Act, uh, that actually gives us or will give us that two trillion uh, to our regional economies by 2030, all relies on that single point right in the middle. And that is consistent and reliable access to the data. Now it's true we've had great relationships with those, all those countries over there uh, for a very long time now. But I think if you ask anyone that works, in, that works with US government agencies right now how they were feeling in the last couple of months as we were heading for yet another government shutdown, US government shutdown. Um, I've also heard talks that the, the, the war in Ukraine is turning Europe very much in, on itself and more, much more focused on doing things for Europe. And while we're at it, how many of here are Optus customers? How reliable do you think your network is right now? Not to mention, looking in the news right now and the geopolitical landscape that has changed. So thinking about all of that, perhaps just having good relationships isn't quite enough. How can we ensure that we maintain access to that satellite data for a large, that large number of government projects that I put up before, not to mention all the local commercial operations that rely on it as well. Now I'd like to take a step back, that's a bit of food for thought just to think on that, but I'd like to take a step back. As Ellie mentioned, uh, in 2014 the, com the European Commission launched the four, first of the Sentinel missions uh, followed by several other missions over the next few years becoming the Copernicus program and providing free and open data uh, that perfectly complemented the existing Landsat data that we'd been using for so long and much more of it. The Copernicus program is served by a set of dedicated satellites that you can see here uh, and supported by contributing missions from uh, other existing commercial uh, satellites plus some public ones as well. Since the launch of Sentinel-1A in 2014, the European Union started a process, as Ali mentioned, to place a constellation of almost 20 satellites in orbit before 2030. Luckily, through Australia's very close ongoing relationship with the European Union, uh, and I mean, we are in Eurovision after all, so we're, <laughs> we're almost Europe. The European uh, Copernicus program at the time was more than happy for us uh, to join a select group of international partners with dedicated priority access to the Sentinel data. 
This guaranteed even more data for our local, local Earth observation community to use. But, I love this diagram. It's a horrible one, but I love it. This spaghetti diagram illustrates the submarine network cable map for the world. And you can see Australia down the bottom there, and it doesn't matter which way you go, it is a credibly long and complex way to get back to Europe. Um, it shows the continent, uh, the, so it shows that Australia's continent is actually at the end of the longest network backburn in the world. Uh, and not to mention some of our poor South Pacific uh, uh, countries who actually attach to us to the rest of the world. So what I'm trying to say there, it's complicated. Our network connectivity with, with Europe is long enough to demonstrate that the speed of light is not instantaneous. It actually takes time to get the light to get from one end to the other. Downloading such huge quantities of data over such a long link with so many hops and nodes means there are significant advantages to synchronising our own copy within our region and having it accessible to everyone. On the flip side, it also means that we have our own copy that is secure against the vagaries of the international events that I mentioned earlier. So with a foresight ahead of its time, the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub, uh, or COP Hub as I'll refer to it, it's much easier to say, uh, came into existence. With the aim of providing a uh, freely accessible sovereign copy, copy of Sentinel data uh, within in the hub within 12, 12 hours of it being published in Europe. COP Hub was initially built as a first port of call for bulk government scientific research users with the benefits for everyone, both in Europe and in our region. It was, uh, as Ali mentioned, it was established under a series of partnership arrangements uh, with a group of consortium partners from federal and state government entities, all with a vested interest in accessing Sentinel data um, and they were prepared to finance and oversee the operations and management of the hub. Behind the scenes, our national delivery partners over in the corner there were uh, engaged to provide data synchronisation and distribution across our region via a, a federally funded national digital research infrastructure. Uh, and of course, let's not forget our European partners uh, who, who have facilitated our access to the free and pr or priority access to the free, uh, free data. Uh, and as mentioned, the infrastructure is not just for Australia. Our regional users are an important part of Cobb Hub's community, uh, and we're very much supporting them as well. The purple outline on this map represents the primary region of interest uh, for all the products in the hub. Um, and as Ellie mentioned, it's about a quarter of the globe that we store. So after five years of successfully delivering Sentinel data to our region, um, and providing that critical joining component, as I said in the first slide, where are we now? As of this year, and in, uh, we have uh, 6.3 petabytes of data, um, and in fact these numbers come from July, so it's quite a bit more than that now. Uh, and over 10.3, we're actually up to 10.7 million products um, in the hub right now. Um, over the life of the hub, as Ali mentioned, uh, we've seen 25 petabytes of downloads uh, by our partners and users. We have over 1,400 registered users on our subscription list with around 230 or so active users, although that is actually very difficult for us to measure and it's probably a lot more than that. We currently hold 10 product lines from the Sentinel 1, 2, 3 and 5 precursor mission. Uh, as you can see here, um, some relative amounts. Again, these are a little bit old, so just add a bit to them. It grows very fast, <laughs> as I'll get to. Now, 6.3 petabytes is a very big number. So just to put some perspective things, I want to give you an idea of just how much data that really is. Now, I might be showing my age here, as, as I was saying to Ali before. I remember the old 3.5 inch floppy disks. <laughs> which had a massive 1.4 megabytes of data. Actually, I remember when floppy disks were actually floppy, but I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> You'd need four billion of those floppy disks to hold all the data in Cop Hub. If you stack them up, it would be a stack uh, 13,000 kilometres high. 
That's big. Yes. Uh, I actually did have to do the math about three or four times just to confirm that, but yes, it is. All right, uh, later generations might better appreciate that 6.3 petabytes would hold around 1.3 billion digital photos. A person would have to take 50,000 photos a day for their entire life to get that many photos. If you're into music, it's almost 2 billion songs. That's 20 times the leading streaming service. Uh, the playlist would take at least 11,000 years to listen to. <laughs> uh, and if your movies are more your bent, 6.3 petabytes would hold about one and a half million high quality movies. It'd take you 300 years to watch them end to end. <laughs> now I don't have the time for all that, but on a more practical note, uh, it, does do present, it does present some operational challenges. Last year we conducted an audit of all our holdings the script checking the uh, metadata for errors across every one of our products ran continuously for three weeks. Uh, if we needed to replenish our collection, we estimate it would take at least six months of continuous operation to re-ingest everything we currently hold. That's not downloading it, that's just re-ingesting it. So we're really talking big data. All right, so that's what we currently hold. Let's have a look at what's going out the door. As expected, our partners are our biggest users, and the partner synchronizations of their respective jurisdictions do account for about 90% of uh, the downloads from CopHub. Having said that, if we ignore the partner synchronizations, we still see significant usage of CopHub by the community. This table shows the relative percentage of downloads during 2021 and 2022 from our user base without the partner syncs. Uh, representing a total of about a million products being downloaded over that time. Uh, I would point out that our current system is not set up for metrics, so there's a bit of jiggery-pokery into producing these figures, but it gives you an idea of the types of regions and the types of data walking out the door. We do have a group of around 20 users from across the region who regularly download products they are interested, and you can see some of the bigger numbers in this table that represents where they are. Uh, uh, but with, even without those top users, uh, we, see product, uh, we see good usage of products and regions across the board, uh, with users coming from Australia, of course, but also the Philippines, New Zealand, New Caledonia, China, Indonesia, and Thailand. By far the most popular products are the Sentinel-2 products, as you can see. Uh, uh, and it's sort of the, the Sentinel-2 level 2 product uh, the more processed product is about two-thirds of that, so a two to one. Um, if we ignore our top users uh, and pull them out of the equation, that preference increases to about 86% for Sentinel-2. Again, with that two to one on the, on the level two, level one. Uh, the remaining downloads are split roughly across the Sentinel-1 uh, GRD and uh, SLC products and the Sentinel-3 Ulchi products. Some more numbers, just our user breakdowns. I won't go into detail there, but you can see uh, where they come from and what sort of activities and sectors they're coming from. So a little bit of a breakdown. Again, across a uh, very even, sp uh, good spread across the board. This is another graph. Uh, I promise there's not too many more of them. Um, just showing, so that first column is year old data. So it's showing our archive is actually being used. Um, and I expect that to increase more as Sentinel moves closer to that 10 year mark and we'll see more time series type data going out. So people will be more interested in the older stuff. Uh, in 2022, CopHub served, uh, surveyed our users to get an idea of future requirements. Now while it was a small survey, we did get some useful findings. A good proportion of our users very much rely on the service and not unexpectedly the ability to quickly download any project, a product from the entire Sentinel range within our region was top of the list, uh, along with the assurance that the data will always be there, getting back to that consistent and reliable service. There were some interesting stats around what type, type of data people use, um, as I've already talked about. For instance, people generally wanted the level two stuff for, level, uh, for Sentinel two, but level one stuff for Sentinel one uh, three. Interesting, don't know what to do with it, but it's interesting. Um, however, in the main, people most, uh, most people used a range of products across the entire selection, 
Uh, and it was based on the, the current task at hand, uh, which changed, obviously. Um, so therefore, people were using picking and matching as they know. It was clear that being able to immediately grab whatever was needed was a really good thing. All right, as I said, no more numbers. Let's move on to stuff, other stuff. So with CopHub operating for five years now, what have been our successes? Perhaps the biggest but least visible success is the ongoing relationship of the consortium partners uh, and the governance structure that they've put around it to keep CopHub going, um, and it's been key to for it to lasting so long. I've been working in government uh, agencies for most of my career, and it's not very often that you come across a multi-party government committee that is so strong. I can give you examples of where it's taken five years to get multiple agencies into the same room, let alone uh, five disparate agencies uh, working together in the same room, meeting regularly and, and uh, successfully operating the hub. Perhaps two key success mechanisms have been a commitment from all parties to fund both in funding and in Kaiser resources, um, to encourage investment uh, and collaboration between all parties uh, and giving a sense of ownership that means that uh, we provide benefits to everyone. Secondly, regular communication at monthly committee meetings. Uh, and they happen every month. Uh, there's no ducking out. So allowing everybody to have a say uh, and ensuring everybody gets what they need. On top, of this, uh, on top of this, there are direct benefits from the collective technical expertise of all the partners. The partners represent a group of, of uh, Sentinel users, uh, very long time Sentinel users, and have built up on a huge expertise. And that is available across not just the partnership, but to all our users as well. Uh, I saw this cooperation in action last month at a meeting between Queensland and New South Wales uh, and uh, GA representatives, exploring commonalities with the Sentinel-2 processing and the impact that Sentinel-2 version 5 reprocessing, reprocessing that's happening right now, will have. This workshop was incredibly easy to set up uh, due to the ongoing cooperation between the partners. It was literally an idea, a couple of phone calls, and we were there. Very, very easy. Um, and because it doesn't happen, if it isn't a selfie, there's a proof in the corner. So the partnership itself is a big success and delivers impact across uh, the government as an example of how good governance can work. But I'd, learn, not, I'd now like to present some examples of, from some of the partners showcasing how Sentinel data has been used to deliver national scale services and products. For over 25 years in Queensland, the Department of Environment and Science uh, has been monitoring and mapping Queensland's landscape using remote sensing data. Historically, the primary source of the Sentinel imagery was Landsat series, as expected, but they were looking to expand data sources to improve their operational statewide monitoring and mapping programs. Sentinel imagery available from COPHUB has provided an additional source of satellite imagery to complement existing data sets. The high resolution and increased frequency of the Sentinel data has allowed enhancements to operational workflows, such as mapping fractional ground cover, woody and riparian vegetation, and seasonal crop mapping. The, the reliability and consistency of access through COPHUB, there's that message again, has allowed the department to develop an automated system for download, storage, processing, and analysis of Sentinel satellite imagery. This includes surface reflectance, seasonal comp composites, water masks and water index. I do apologise for reading, this is science stuff that's out of my jurisdiction. Combined with, an, with new high performance computing technology and the incre increased frequency of data, it is now possible to develop timely fire scar mapping and vegetation regrowth monitoring for, uh, for other emergency applications. The statewide land cover and trees study, as you, I've got here and demonstrated on the screen here, is a scientific monitoring program undertaken by the department's remote sensing sciences team in partnership with other Queensland and New South Wales agencies to support a range of sustainable land management, biodiversity and conservation initiatives. By adapting the SLAPS workflow to the short revisit time of Sentinel-2 uh, products, the team have been able to develop an early detection system this system is a proactive, early engagement compliance tool used by the Department of Resources, uh, Queensland Department of Resources, as part of its ongoing monitoring and compliance program for land clearing. 
and more importantly means that proactive intervention can be implemented rather than prosecuting after the fact when the uh, full damage has been done. In New South Wales, the Department of Planning and Environment, and I've just been told they've ch changed their name again, uh, has been working with the New South Wales Rural <laughs> Fire Service uh, to develop fire, uh, the Fire and Extent uh, Severity Mapping Project. Information about the severity of a fire in a landscape is critical to understanding the relationship between fuels, fire behaviour and landscapes. But this research requires a consistent approach to mapping fire extent and severity across the whole state. The department scientists used surf surface reflectance uh, and fractional cover images derived from Cophub Sentinel-2 archives to compare before and after fire events. This data was then used to train and test machine learning algorithms that now deliver near real-time maps of fire severity. Maps are produced as each fire event stabilises and provides an understanding of how a fire has changed the landscape at a detailed level. As with Queensland, the reliability and consistency of access to high-frequency Sentinel-2 imagery through COPHUB allowed a semi-automated approach, and this was critical for building the maps at a statewide scale. So you can see them here. So you can see over there is one event, but then that can be translated into a state, uh, the whole state. Uh, it, support, it has supported fire behaviour and fuel hazard assessment, rapid post-fire response operations and fuel assessments. In addition, the maps are being produced year on year, which are being incorporated into the New South Wales Fire History Database. This uh, database enables New South Wales agencies to understand vegetation changes resulting from fire events, as well as vegetation trends that impact fire behaviour over time. Fire severity maps also have the potential to support research into fire emissions, uh, as well as the health impacts of smoke uh, and perhaps carbon dynamics as well. Now, I was going to give a, a quick anecdote here, and I don't have a lot of details, but uh, at that workshop, somebody mentioned that um, they, use they used to use drones to um, cover, uh, uh, to monitor a hazard reduction burns. Um, and apparently, uh, by using a drone, because it can't get very far in, it has to be line of sight to the operator, they were only at measuring the edge effect. Uh, and when they visited the same areas using satellite technology, they discovered that the drones, by doing the edge effect, were only getting, uh, were, were saying that, yes, everything's burnt, that's fine. But inside, it wasn't being burnt. And it was only satellite imagery that actually de de determined that. Earth observation data has been used around the world to monitor oil discharges in coastal and ocean waters for some time now uh, and has very much reduced its occurrence wherever a detection system has been in place. The CSIRO has been working on the development of a semi-automated oil slick detection system tailored to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park based solely on Sentinel data uh, as no such service was available in Australia at the time. The project used a large, curated, global, historic data set of uh, SAR imagery, uh, synthetic, synthetic aperture radar, uh, imagery require, uh, acquired by Sentinel-1. The advantage of the radar imagery is that it is not affected by clouds, which on the Great Barrier Reef is a bit of a problem during the tropical wet season. Um, as an aside, it also is not affected by smoke, so it works really well for bushfires as well. The, pro the project assessed uh, empirical rule-based approaches and a deep learning model to discriminate between oil-like features, as you can see over in the corner there, uh, and lookalikes uh, in scenes acquired over the reef. Lookalike features, as you can see there, are things like biogenic or algal slicks, uh, reef features, and low wind features, to try to rule those out. The project determined that using a combined workflow, as in using both of those techniques, gave the best result and provided a very reliable detection of oil-like features that will greatly improve the monitoring of unreported oil discharge events across the whole reef. The process has also been demonstrated to work for other areas in our region, such as Australia's Northwest Shelf, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Zyro is also working on an algorithm using Sentinel-3 imagery to produce multi-year Great Barrier Reef-wide remotely sensed water quality and atmospheric correction assessments for the e-reef project, mouthful, which is an information platform to support current and emergency management issues for the Great Barrier Reef. 
Originally using MODIS data, CSIRO switched to the near real-time Sentinel-3 Ulchi products to gain greater spatial and spectral resolution, and in particular gained some extra bands that gave much, much better detection of algal blooms. These remote sensing products compute the water quality scores for the, as you can see in the middle there, uh, for the annual Great Barrier Reef, uh, Reef report card. Now, while the science is great, what is really cool about this project was they were able to set up a validation sta station at the end of the Lucinda Pier in North Queensland. That's a six kilometre long pier out into the reef. Um, and they put this uh, um, shipping container of, of measurements. Uh, it gets, um, uh, the, the, the pier is actually used to load sugar onto bulk freighters, um, but the, it has to be checked every two weeks. Now, wouldn't that be a great job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know what I'd be doing every two weeks. Um, in Geoscience Australia here, uh, there are several groups working with COPHUB and Sentinel data. And I'm not going to cover everything, but I'll just give you some, some, uh, uh, some examples. So the Digital Earth Australia group uh, branch is creating a suite of foundational products covering the entire Australian continent. For example, the Surface Reflectance Analysis Ready Data search Sets, which have been processed using Sentinel-2 imagery, but with corrections specific to Australia for the inconsistencies such as atmosphere, cloud cover, terrain, shadow, and sun and, uh, sun and satellite position. Uh, DEA have also created a time series data set that estimates how the volume of water bodies in Australia changes over time using digital earth, uh, elevation models. Uh, the aforementioned uh, surface reflectance um, imagery and water observation data. DEA's water volume estimates are being used to assess on-farm storage across the northern Murray-Darling Basin, bringing increased transparency and accountability and promoting water compliance and its, and its enforcement. In the past, the surface, areas, uh, surface water areas were being produced from Landsat satellites, but like other partners, switching to Sentinel-2 products has allowed a daily near real-time surface water areas to be calculated for a three-month rolling window. The Geodesy Group in the Positioning Australia branch is developing a ground surface movement reconnaissance tool using Sentinel-1 SAR imagery to identify ground displacements over time. The image in top right is Canberra and the light colours are things that have moved. <laughs> uh, um, don't panic too much, we're talking millimetres here. Um, the time series for each, uh, so, uh, but in the future they're going to be looking at uh, key areas around, across, across the Australian continent. A time series for each area is generated by measuring the differences in the signal phase between the master image and the consecutive images. A negative phase indicates an uplift um, and uh, vice versa. But it's not quite as simple as that because the satellite is actually looking sideways and not down. The movement is, has both a vertical and horizontal component which they have to work out account for and be corrected. Uh, as, do, as does the tectonic plate, plate motion. As we all know, Australia is moving uh, northeast um, to Bali at around seven centimetres a year, uh, as well as a digital ele elevation model and atmospheric errors which also need to be corrected. However, in the end, this tool will provide an overview of ground surface movement over time across these key areas. This data will be of interest to all spheres of government involved in urban planning and building infrastructure, as well as those involved in monitoring uh, and mapping uh, natural hazards like landslides and earthquakes. All right, uh, a bit on of a side note, it's not, this, uh, it's not just the science that has been a success for COPHUB. Our relationship with the European Space Agency and the European Commission has allowed us to capitalise on the Comer Copernicus Emergency Management Service, um, which you can see how, over there. This, while this service is now a freely available, globally accessible service, our relationship allowed us to establish early access to Australia's, for Australia's emer emergency response teams. Particularly gaining access to the SEMS rapid mapping team that produces near real-time maps of disaster affected areas within hours of a satellite overpass. Um, noting that this service doesn't, doesn't just use Sentinel satellites, uh, under the European agreement, the SEM service is actually able to access any European satellites that have free, uh, a free allocation. Um, in 21 and 22, when many parts of Australia were being subject to a repeated devastated flooding, and we're still hearing the results of that in the news right now, 
Uh, we initiated a total of nine activations on behalf of Australian emergency management uh, agencies. This saw the, the, the SEMS rapid mapping team generate over 150 maps, like these ones here, um, over those nine activations. Um, and these maps were used to assist ground operations and were instrumental in the analysis and decision-making process at each of these events. All right, now my, my background obviously is not in Earth observation. Um, I, as Ali mentioned, I'm a bit more of an IT nerd, but even to me, I think these examples de demonstrate the incredible power of Earth observation data, and in particular Sentinel products. But it's not just that these are real world answers, but they can be uh, delivered quickly in an automated fashion uh, and, and at a large scale across states, countries, and the, on the whole region if needed. All right, um, so now we're gonna take a step back uh, and go behind the scenes and look at the technology. But before I do, um, I'd like, uh, I want to first acknowledge our major delivery partner, the National Com Computational Infrastructure Facility, um, or NCI, uh, based at ANU here in Canberra, who have been a key partner in this adventure. In particular, because we don't conform to the usual supercompute paradigm of a little bit of storage Mac uh, next to heaps of teraflops of, of compute. We're the exact opposite. We have massive amounts of data and really don't need that much compute. Um, although having all that data right next to one of Australia's biggest supercomputers isn't a bad thing for our users either. Um, all right, um, but far, far, far more critical uh, have been the expertise and contacts that the NCI's engine, network engineers um, have uh, and have put to use that have been absolutely instrumental in keeping CopHub on track um, uh, and running. Remember that spaghetti diagram that I threw up before, which is why I really like that diagram? The engineer's ability to have contacts at every single one of those nodes, be able to tweak the network links between here and Europe has been absolutely critical. I cannot stress that enough, um, but it's absolutely critical to make CopHub one of the largest ongoing data network transfers in Australia. Um, I, I can just give you, I can give you a whole heap of examples of where we've hit a roadblock uh, and NCI said, oh, I know who that is, I'll go and talk to them, and they've tweaked some, uh, some config on a network box somewhere in the world and it's flowing again. So I, I really must stress how critical that's been. The current Cop Hub infrastructure that we're using today was built from scratch in 2017. Uh, mostly because there was <coughs> nothing really suitable to meet our no local requirements. Cop Hub was set up not just as a simple mirror, but to provide data in a fashion needed by our Australian agencies. With new spatial searches, additional metadata, and a directory structure that allowed easily programmable access. Um, access to the data is, via, is provided via multiple pathways. You can actually see here each one of those screens is a separate component of what is now CopHub. So over in the corner there, we've got our, uh, our Copernicus portal. Um, in the middle is SARA, which is the user portal that allows users to download, uh, search for and download individual products. Um, behind the scenes of SARA is an API portal that can be, can, uh, will allow bulk downloads. Um, and also, uh, the NCI um, partners provide a threads service, which is a, a backdoor to the, directly to the file system. But now the technology is out of date. When CopHub first started, there were a few, a few mechanisms to monitor for new or changed products, particularly reprocessed products, um, and trying to ha hunt them down and grab them when they came up was very difficult. So complex API searches were developed to monitor the European hubs this means, this means that even minor changes to our product synchronizations right now require complex script changes. Um, it's band-aids on band-aids on band-aids at the moment. But all things changed at the end of last year when the European Space Agency announced a bold new plan uh, to replace all existing hubs with a, single, a new single cloud-based central platform that would provide all access to Sentinel data, both users and the international partners. Um, and at the same time, they announced they're gonna turn off all the old hubs once this is operational. Now, there have been a few bumps along the way. 
uh, but this is pretty much what's happened. Um, I won't go into more detail on the, the data space ecosystem here. Please Google it, have a look. It is actually quite powerful, it's quite amazing. That's the, that's the browser in the corner that most users will be using. Um, but then there's all of these tools that are built in as well. The announcement of the data space ecosystem was the final nail, the final nail in the, cop, uh, the coffin for the old cop hub. Uh, and we made the momentous decision to completely replace it. In April this year, we approached Gale Systems in France to help us adopt ESA's recommended hub technology called GSS. Uh, and we're currently working with Gale, ESA, uh, and NCI to implement that as we speak. Rather than separate bespoke components from the old hub, this new system will be a fully integrated uh, hub solution with a few extra modules that we've uh, asked Gael to, to develop for us. It will provide a fully integrated data solution that will di directly connects to and synchronizes with Sentinel products uh, within the CDSE in a way that we've never had before. We don't have to worry about those scripts ever again. It will also have an integrated user portal and a management console. Um, the development of this open source, commercially supported software will at least allow us to continue to function with the new data space platform in Europe, but more importantly gives us the potential expansion options to put us in a much better position for what is to come. And that's where I've got to now. So that's where CopHub's been and where we are right now. But what about the future? As Ali mentioned, the consortium partners have agreed to fund CopHub for another five years, but there are some really significant challenges that CopHub will have to face in the coming years. This simple graph highlights our biggest challenge. Data storage. Apart from the dip in, uh, I think it was July, uh, middle of 2020, uh, where we stopped synchronizing and removed all of our Sentinel-1 raw products, which was taking up a lot of space and nobody was using them. We have consistently been growing at one petabyte a year. That's three to five terabytes a day that we download. Even if nothing changes and we keep going as we are right now, we are already facing a storage issue. This year, pretty much our entire budget will essentially go to storage costs. On top of that, we are having more data, have to move more data at a faster rate. Sometime in the very near immediate or very immediate future, we will need to resynchronize all our entire Sentinel 2 correction, uh, set collection, uh, which is currently being reprocessed by Europe to version 5. Uh, I don't know whether you remember, but uh, about our Sentinel 2 collection is just over half of our entire holdings. Uh, current estimates that we will need 20 times our current network throughput to achieve that. However, that's only if things stay the same. But this image is one of the latest promotional images from Europe, the Copernicus program in Europe. Um, as I mentioned right at the start, they were planning to put a lot more missions into space. We are at that red arrow. Um, we're a little bit, the Europe's a little bit behind because they're having trouble finding uh, a launch platform, things keep blowing up on launch pads. But that's what's planned and in the pipeline right now. Now, some of those missions are <coughs> replacement missions, some of them are not relevant to our region, but it's really clear that there's a lot more stuff going up in the sky and that we will need to get access to that data. And in just over five years, we are looking at the Sentinel Next Generation uh, missions. Now we don't have a lot of detail on those missions just yet, but to give you some food for thought, the Landsat Next missions, they're saying they're going to be delivering 10 to 15 times the data flow that they currently do. By 2030, we are looking at an absolute data tsunami. What do we do about it? Um, and Sorry, this is an essential uh, uh, presentation. This is probably a bit sacrilegious, but I really like the, like the image. But speaking of Landsat image, uh, missions, and returning back to where I was reminiscing right at the start, what about the other Earth observation data out there? 
COPHUB has successfully been providing our region with its own sovereign copy of Sentinel data. But what about the plethora of other open access, large scale Earth observation data out there? And Landsat's not just the only one. Surely the data and network risks I mentioned at the start inspired by, that inspired the original Cop Hub for, or for formation of COPHUB apply to this, this data as well. Even more so given the current geopolitical instability across the world at the moment. Given our long history and reliance on the Landsat missions, do we need to consider a COPHUB model being applied to Landsat, particularly with the on upcoming data volumes that I've mentioned with Landsat Next? With both ESA and NASA scientists collaborating closely with each other in the design of their own next-gen missions, Sentinel and Landsat imagery will only get more and more compatible. It then makes powerful sense to provide these data sets as a complete package in one location for our region. Food for thought. So what do we need to do now to address these challenges of data storage and huge quantities of data um, as they appear on the horizon? Our first step and the process, or as the first step in the process, the COP Hub Steering Committee commissioned uh, CSIRO to conduct a very successful request for information. Uh, exercise. We got well over 30 respondents coming from all over the world and covering all aspects of design, build and operation of Earth observation platforms. The RFI has been an incredibly useful exper uh, experience and forming the possibilities for a future hub and identifying a broad range of capabilities from local and international organisations that would be interested in contributing. It gave us a good picture of the current technological landscape and directions we could possibly explore to address these big challenges, the big data challenges we face. We would definitely need to undertake a more detailed conceptual design of a hub, uh, perhaps in collaboration with some of those respondents, but if in the future the Commonwealth decided to adopt a much more unified approach to Earth Observation Hub, there is certainly sufficient capability and capacity available to build and operate an Australian-based sovereign Earth observation data hub that utilised local expertise and technology and worked within the government's geared funding models. And before I go on, a big thank you to all those respondents. Uh, it was a huge exercise and the effort was very much appreciated. But that RFI was really only the very first step. In the end, the truth is we don't have any of the answers yet. We have some ideas, but we don't really have any ideas. It's clear from the RFI and other sources that while there are incremental improvements in storage technology, there will not be a magic bullet on the horizon that will miraculously allow us to store exabytes of storage at no, little or no cost. Storage will continue to cost big dollars. But there are some options, uh, for example, on-the-fly processing, something that many of the latest generation hubs have already implemented, um, including the data space ecosystem I mentioned earlier. This would mean we'd only need to store and perhaps even synchronise level one data or low level data and process it to the higher level products as we need them. It trades storage costs for the cost of on-demand compute needed to process at the time. We need to do the calculations to see whether that's going to work. But maybe we also need to start asking difficult questions. Do we still need to work towards the greater good of store everything? We do hold a few products that are almost totally unused, particularly with the increased accessibility of the data space ecosystem and other glo global Earth observation platforms, not to mention some cloud-based storage that already has access to some of that data or provides access to that data. Do we instead focus on a priority set of products relevant, specifically relevant for our region? <coughs> Do we start to develop and encourage use of a consistent Australian or regional level two or ARD product and no longer store the European derived products um, that are not as suitable for our region? Do we invest in helping our regional partners to build and maintain their own hubs? Um, our support for the region comes from our expertise and not storing everything they need. I recognise these may be very controversial que questions, particularly because in many cases they counter what COP Hub was built on and has stood for in the last five years. 
And I'm certainly not going to answer those questions right now. But the reality is the COP Hub partnership will need to explore everything in the next few years to ensure the continued ongoing provision of satellite data to our region. Thank you.